one statement I love to make when a conference comes to an end such as this. It's uh, the statement, all good things come to an end except heaven. <laughs> and uh, for today, that's even more relevant because I am dealing with the topic of the return of Christ. Let me invite you to turn to the Acts of the Apostles, Acts and chapter 1. We will read from verse 6 down to verse 11. And uh, as you do so, really I'm speaking on behalf of my fellow speakers at this conference that uh, we've not only appreciated the opportunity to be with you in fellowship and to minister in this way, uh, but also to uh, ex experience something of uh, the feedback that we have received from a number of you as we have been mingling. It's clear we are among friends. We are among uh, the, the brethren uh, in, in the Lord. And I'd like to encourage you with that sweet spirit that you might continue uh, in the same way. Acts chapter 1 and commencing with verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, brethren, as we come to the end of uh, quite a feast of uh, looking in from various angles at the theme of remembering Jesus Christ, we, we finally come to remembering him in terms of his second coming or his return. I was joking with uh, the previous speaker that really perhaps we ought to have swapped places because uh, as I was listening to him opening up the marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven, I, I thought we've arrived. We've arrived. I'm in heaven. There we are experiencing something of uh, the sublime goodness of God in our final destination. But I think it's only right that having looked at that, we now start thinking in terms of the departure lounge, that point where we'd finally take off and, and, and go to enjoy something of what has been spoken about. It's crucial for us to realize that the subject of the second coming of Christ is not a side topic to be engaged in by those who are either curious or have perhaps a little more of uh, a desire to study eschatology or you know, those who really just want to delve into something that lacks practical significance. It's of the very warp and woof of the Christian life. We, when, when you think about the Christian faith, it has a sense of movement. It has a sense of direction. And there is that point that the Christian life 
moves towards like the tip of a spear, and there is the return of our Lord. For instance, when the Apostle Paul describes uh, the grace of God that has come to us in our salvation that, that teaches us to say no to all ungodliness and worldly passions, writing to Titus, this is the way he puts it. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And you remember I spoke about all people without distinction rather than without exception. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now listen to this. Waiting for our blessed hope. And what is that? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the way in which Paul perceived the Christian faith, that it is one of an active waiting, waiting for the return of our Lord and Savior. And it is our hope, our blessed hope. Or as he puts it with respect to the testimony of the Thessalonians, after Paul had ministered there and many of them had come to faith in Christ. Listen to the way in which he describes them in 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1. He says there in verse 9, for they themselves, talking about people around Macedonia where he is going, evangelizing, and what they have heard concerning the work in Thessalonica. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and here it is, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivered us or who delivers us from the wrath to come. Again, you can see that it was the common testimony of the people of God in Thessalonica that people picked up and were reporting elsewhere, that here are a people who are waiting for a savior, his second coming. If I could throw in one more, and it's, it's our Lord's Supper that I trust you participate in fairly regularly. And the, the Apostle Paul referring uh, to that puts it this way, that whenever we participate in the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death, and then he adds, until he comes. So we have that view that his death is not the end. His resurrection is not the end. His ascension is not the end. This Jesus, to borrow the words of Acts again, whom we have seen going up in this way, will return. And for, for the Lord's Supper imagery, that's even more important because it was meant to, uh, to, to be a, a picture of what would happen at a betrothal, again going back to the earlier image of the wedding feast of the Lamb. When, when a young man engaged a, a, a young lady for marriage, he would then, at, on that occasion, drink together with her the fruit of the vine as part of that engagement, and then he would go to prepare a home where finally he would come back to get her so that he can take her to his matrimonial home. So the very fact that they've had this meal together says to her, my bridegroom is coming back. It's not simply enjoying the meal, but it is bringing out this truth that someone 
has made this promise to me. An all important promise. So between now and then, I live in this hope, in this anticipation, that I will hear the cry in the streets before long, the bridegroom is here, the bridegroom is here, and I know I'm packing up and going on into my marriage. Well, that's really the picture that the Lord's Supper should bring to us every time we have it. We are a people in anticipation, a people in genuine expectancy. Our bridegroom is coming back to take us home. Now, as we get back to this occasion at the beginning of the book of Acts, I think we need to, as it were, enter into the shoes of these brethren. On, on one hand, they, they, they had gone through the most traumatic experience when they had seen their Savior nailed to the cross, finally expire, put into a tomb. Well, there was some moment of excitement when they now were able to see him again for about 40 days. They, they mingled with him. They had become disillusioned, depressed. Some of them had gone back to their previous professions and so on, catching fish. Now he's come back. And then there they are seeing him with their own eyes going through the sky through the clouds gone you can understand why they were still looking it's gone that hope that we had that will be with him longer he's gone and then two angels standing among them tell them this fact that this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. They were given this promise, this promise to hang on to. He died, he came again briefly, he's gone, he will return. And what I want us to do is to look at a number of facts concerning this. Uh, first of all, I want us to look at the certainty of his coming, then the timing, the content, the purpose, and at least two implications of this, and we are done. First of all, the certainty of his coming. That's what these two Men standing by them in white robes would be saying to them, he's basically saying, or they are basically saying, take it from us that he is coming again. The basic point that I want to bring out there is that, in fact, when you read the, the Old Testament, and of course the New, as we'll be doing in a few minutes, over and over and over again, this thought is brought out that there would, were to be two comings of the God man into the world. There was the first, which we studied in the incarnation and his final death and resurrection and so on. There was that, but there was also literally side by side in the Bible across the Old Testament, the fact that he's also going to come in another way, and especially coming in, in power, in victory, in a way in which he will destroy all the enemies of his people. In fact, one of the reasons why Jesus was rejected in his first coming was because so many individuals in reading the Old Testament limited themselves to the second coming. And so as far as they were concerned, it doesn't make sense 
that this great champion and captain of the Lord's people should now be hanging on a cross in complete shame and, and weakness and so forth. It didn't tie up with them. And yet, as far as the Bible is concerned, the two went together. Let me just quickly show that to you from Isaiah and uh, not so much chapter 53, which also has a lot of information there, but chapter 52 before going into chapter 53. I want you to notice these two together. Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, now listen to this, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so that's to do with his first coming and the extent of his suffering. We saw that in his death. But listen to verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. And then, of course, chapter 53 opens up that topic. But the thing I want you to notice there is the way in which the, the prophet Isaiah literally puts these two next to each other. And one of the reasons why is, as has been uh, said, there was this prophetic view across the landscape of time that saw the first coming and the second coming as though they were next to each other. And so as the prophet would look, he would see Christ in his first coming, see Christ in his second coming, and make it look as though it was really just a year or two between the two events. Now, here's my point. The same prophets who prophesied his first coming prophesied the second. And they prophesied the first coming with such detail, such minutest detail, that you would think these individuals lived in the days of Jesus and then simply wrote as though they lived much, much earlier. Now, brethren, if the prophets were so correct on the first coming, why would you even entertain the thought that they would be wrong on the second coming? Why? If they have proved as Isaiah does in chapter 53, so much detail concerning the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ, well, we have every reason to believe they should be right on the fact he is coming again. So I'd like to give that to you as a simple argument, a logical argument that should undergird your faith that our Savior is truly coming again. And when Jesus Christ was here on earth, you recall how, especially towards the end of his life, he shifted in emphasis in terms of what he was often speaking about. He often, as we shall see in a few minutes, spoke about that same second coming. Now, here is the one who has already proved himself to be true in every way. And now he is deliberately, over and over again, speaking about his second coming. Surely, we should rest in the fact that this is certain. But secondly, what about the timing? What about the timing? Well, let me draw your attention to Matthew and chapter 24. Matthew 24, because uh, they, he, in a sense, he was asked a question to that effect. 
about the sign of his coming and also about the end of the age. And the thing that I want you to notice as we peep at Matthew chapter 24 is the fact that the Bible, and indeed our Savior here, speaks about a number of major events that were to precede his return. And he speaks about wars, we shall see that, about natural disasters, about apostasy, about the persecution, major persecution that would be coming upon his people. Matthew 24 and verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? So clearly they understood that he had been saying to them, I'm going, but I will come back. And in coming back, I'm bringing certain things to a close, as they're going to say here, and of the end of the age. Well, Jesus initially speaks here about the level of deception that would be there, verse 4. And just answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And then he speaks about wars, and you will hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Speaks about nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then he also adds in natural disasters. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. He deals with not only the persecution that would be happening, but also the betrayal that would take place among God's people and those that would, uh, well, the general apostasy. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And then he goes back to the false prophets and so on. But verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So the Lord says quite a number of things that generally give a sense of this is the eve of his coming. However, the same Lord Jesus is concerned that we, we don't get carried away with trying to find the exact point in history where we can say, aha, 2024 July, he's coming back. And so he speaks in terms of coming like a thief in the night. In um, this same chapter, he, he says, I've, I've skipped quite a bit, let's go to chapter, verse 36. Verse 36. But concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. People are eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage and so on until the end comes. And so it says in verse 39, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. He speaks again in application of this and repeats in verse 44, therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour 
you do not expect. Now, brethren, it amazes me that despite such clarity, you still have people in the church who somehow convince Christians that they have cracked the cord. They know precisely when Jesus is coming again. All we need to do is to read our Bibles. That's all. To avoid being misled. He gives a general sense, but warns against any attempt to pin it down to a year, to a month, or to a day. He is coming like a thief. Not that he's coming secretly in that sense, but he's coming in a way to take so many by surprise. But let's hurry on then to the content because there's quite a lot with respect to the coming itself that the Bible gives us in a number of ways. First of all, I really still want us to keep to chapter uh, 24 and chapter 25. But if I can peep back to Acts and chapter 1, the way in which it was phrased there suggests that it will not be some secret coming that we will not be aware of. The angels, or these two men, say, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, it's going to be a visible return. He's not sort of coming in the person of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and therefore he's come back. No, no, no. It's the same Jesus whom you saw going who will return in this way. It will be visible. It will be an actual personal return, and it will be uh, a return that is bodily. We can actually see him as he returns. In Matthew 24 and uh, verse 30, this is the way he puts it. I'll begin from verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, that is the difficult times you'll be going through, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The natural disasters, the, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see, notice that, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is no secret return. This is one who is the king of kings and lord of lords arriving in the glory of his majesty. That is completely unmistakable that all the nations will quit whatever it is that has at that point attracted their attention and it will be glued onto the Lord Jesus Christ. Or, as he puts it in uh, chapter 25 and verse 31, chapter 25 and verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Notice the emphasis on glory and glory and glory. In other words, there will be the wow factor at that point. And partly because he's descending with the glory of the angels with 
him. We notice, for instance, later in uh, First Thessalonians, that uh, there will be the, the, the trumpet call of God. In other words, it's not just what we are seeing, but it will also be what we are hearing that will attract our attention to the glorious coming of the Son of God. But then attended to his second coming will be the resurrection of the dead. And in that sense, I want us to quickly go to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. While you're turning there, let me remind you of the reading we had just a few minutes ago from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where we were told about at the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise. Well, uh, the Apostle Paul repeats that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, I'll begin reading from verse 16. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Wow. That drowns out all the noises on the planet as God in Christ returns. And then we are told there, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And the Apostle Paul makes the point, encourage one another with these words. Part of the joy that we will experience as God's people at the second coming of Christ is precisely this. That those who've gone ahead of us Whose, whose departure has rent our hearts as they've gone through the veil of death. Those who love the Lord and, and serve the Lord together with us, who filled our pews as we worshipped the living God, but the cold hand of death clutched at them and, and tore them out of our lives. On that occasion, we will see them. For they will return with him and their bodies will rise from the grave, be joined to their souls, and we will join them on that occasion. What a glorious reunion it will be. But for those of us who are alive when he returns, there's also the transformation that will take place in our bodies. We saw that from 1 Corinthians, didn't we? When the apostle Paul spoke about the fact that the kind of bodies we have cannot inherit this eternity that we are going to. He said there, Chapter 15, halfway through, verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And here it is, and we shall be changed. We shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. Brethren, on that occasion, we will know that death 
even in terms of its seed, which is within us, has finally been overcome through the victory that was purchased at Calvary, but now is being fully realized. To borrow the words that Paul shares with the Philippians, he says that our mortal bodies will be transformed into something of his glorious body. We can imagine ourselves shining like the sun in its noonday strength. In these glorious bodies that we will have being given on that occasion. I really must read those words because of the contrast that the Apostle Paul gives with those who die in sin. He, he puts it this way. Referring to those who die in their sins, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Philippians 3 verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Wow. What a chance. On one hand, the community of God's people, the loved ones who left us drowning in our own tears, being before us, but now in glorious bodies. And we too, completely changed into something of that glorious body of our Lord. And the Apostle Paul says, off we go to be with him and to be with him forever. And therefore, in the midst of our tears, let us encourage one another. Allow me to add one more, and it is the final judgment. The final judgment. There's something said in, in the book of Revelation of of uh, the spirits of righteous men made perfect who are in, in, in glory. And whatever your views of eschatology might be, at least one thing we agree that they are saying, Lord, for how long will we continue this way without finally being vindicated? For well, that day, when the Lord returns, will be him bringing the final judgment together. Back to Matthew, and this time chapter 25. He says there, we ended with the statement, he will sit on his glorious throne. Verse 31. But now he goes on to say, before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the gods. On the side of the sheep, there is him saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the evidence of the transformation of their lives is the love that oozed out of their beings, especially towards the people of God. Verse 41, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, the ultimate evidence of a lack of regeneration is the absence of love, especially for the people of God. Verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. What is that telling us? 
is the fact that even if you die on the wrong side of justice because your enemies have twisted the judicial system in order to destroy your name, destroy your reputation, destroy your property, destroy your family, maybe even destroy you in the process. Don't think you've lost in the end. The God who sits on the throne is a God of justice. He has said, vengeance is mine. I will repair. And on that day, justice will be meted out. And we will be grateful that this God of grace is the all-powerful one who will finally right all the wrong and finally also bring us into his heaven. All that is what Jesus Christ keeps pointing to, that it's related to this second coming. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? I want to suggest to you that the purpose is to wrap up redemptive history. You see, life, has a direction. That's one reason why I love my Bible. Because it, it begins with the beginning. And it ends with the end. It, it's not a book of some religious philosopher who's been gazing on his novel and imagining certain messages coming to him and he's, he's just bunching them together in some kind of mysterious way. No. This book gives us the agenda of God. There is creation. Then there's the fall. Then there is redemption. And final consummation. That's where history is gone. And those of us who have turned from sin and put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, the drama of history may still be unfolding and there is a winning here and a losing there in the midst of all that, but hey, we know. We have been given the opportunity to peep at the end of the movie. You know what that means? Those moments when that main actor looks like he's been slain, he has died. They've riddled him with some bullets or put a sword through his ribs. And there we are saying, what's happened? What's happened? The guy we are sitting with who's watching it the second time round is smiling. Yes, he's not stressed up because he knows what's about to happen and the final victory of that main actor. Well, friends, here, yeah, this is not mere movie. This is not mere acting. This is now reality. But that's where history is going, brethren. It's going to that point where the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will return, put to an end all this nonsense that is filling up humanity at the moment. Bring in his elect people. By grace, give them their rewards and gather all those that were in rebellion against him and send them to that place called the lake of fire. And he will be seen for who he is, the great 
and glorious, majestic God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of his coming. Allow me to hurry on then to the implications. Two implications. First of all, is to plead with any among us who may still be unreconciled to this king. Oh, with all the love in my being, may I implore you, this Jesus is coming again. And he won't come in weakness. He won't be fighting with individuals who are using their political power to to frustrate anything that's taking place. He is coming in glorious might. All be reconciled to him now. Don't waste another day. This is the time for you to heed the warnings of Scripture. By repenting of all your sin, repenting of all your your rebellion against him, and trusting in his finished work on the cross. That through his shed blood, your sins might be forgiven. And then secondly and lastly, it's the rest of us who are God's people. To borrow the words of 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. Let's give ourselves unreservedly to serving King Jesus. The Apostle Paul ends that chapter with the words, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He is bringing his rewards. So throw all your weight into serving him. Use your gifts to that end. In fact, Jesus gives at least two parables towards the end of Matthew, talking about the one who gave out these uh, talents, coming back and calling his servants to give an account. Oh, friends, Throw all your weight into serving him. In the end, you will be grateful that that's exactly what you did. Let me quickly wrap up by taking us back to those words. These two men said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the entire Bible says, surely I am coming soon. May we respond by saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Eternal and gracious God, thank you that history is going somewhere and that at the very tip of the spear is the return of your son. Oh God, there's so much in our hearts that longs for that moment. Ultimately, the beauty of being with our Savior forever. But Lord, we think too of so much suffering that we as your people have gone through, longing for that reward, the malice 
that we've suffered from. Longing for our vindication. The loss of loved ones that's still so fresh upon our hearts. Being reunited with them. Oh Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.